Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Van Eck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very pleased to welcome to Forward Guidance, Jonathan Trussard, founder of Trussard Capital Management. John- Jonathan, great to meet you. Uh, how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Jack. It's my pleasure, Jonathan. You had a you stor- storied career on the quantitative side, on the risk management side, and you know, obviously now you're in, you're in wealth management. Back in the day when you got your PhD, you did a lot of work on financial bubbles. And before I ask you, are we in a bubble now or do you see any bubbles on the horizon as we, as we stand here now, I want to ask, what are the hallmarks of a bubble? What is kind of the checklist where, okay, you know, these, these 10 things, if you get eight or nine of them, it's, you know, it's probably a bubble. Again, that's a great question and a great place to start. And, and I did a lot of work researching bubbles, not as a PhD student at, at BU, but actually during my undergrad time. Uh, at UCLA, I had the the great fortune of being uh, a student and, and a research assistant uh, and a co-author for for a time to Earl Thompson, who was just a fabulous mentor and just a, a great thinker. And and we spent a lot of time thinking about the you know kind of the great bubbles in history. This was the two thousand and one two thousand and three period as the tech bubble was bursting. So bubbles, uh, look uh, pretty clearly, uh, you know the mechanical description of a bubble is a market that is unsustainably expensive relative to fundamentals, uh, and one in which there is a reason argument for there is no pathway to the fundamentals justifying the prices over the foreseeable future. Uh, and as a result of that, at the first sign of trouble, the whole, you know, kind of souffle just kind of collapses onto itself. So that's, that's the mechanical answer, which is, you know, loony valuations, a lot of excitement in the marketplace, uh, leaving close to no room for rationality to actually back up these prices on a secular horizon. The other thing, and again, this is where I really want to give credit to Earl for, for his understanding of bubbles and, and what he taught me during that time, it really helps to understand that those bubbles, the big ones, the ones that, you know, people talk about, write about, you know, 10 years, 50 years, hundreds of years after the fact, they tend to live in a bigger context, in a in an environment where something like, quote unquote, a new technology, a new thing has revealed itself. That's number one. Uh, and I'll give you the example of, you know, some of the bigger historic bubbles that uh, I think are worth studying, like the South Sea bubble, like the Mississippi bubble in the 1600s. And, you know, the technology of the time was exploration. And the fact that there was this land, you know, way out into the distance, and if you could get there, and you could get the stuff and bring it back home, uh, there was all this value to be generated. And so the point is, you know, that's technology, that's a that's a, a new quote, unquote, new paradigm, you know, uh, and it does excite uh, people's imagination for good reasons. The other thing which, you know, gets a little more subtle, but I think is important, is you have to think of bubbles as arising in within a society where kind of the preferred social order is changing. And somehow there is a desire for and that can be explicit or implicit and i think more often than not it's implicit though with the case of the south sea bubble i think it was very explicit and i'll tell you why in a second there is a desire for kind of like moving the chips on the board and what i mean by that is like some people were in charge and now some other people really are favored and it's just a way to kind of redistribute wealth in the case of the South Sea bubble, it was painfully obvious where Stuart I was the king of the Scots. Uh, and all of a sudden he was put in charge of England. And he's like, I'm a Scot. I don't really like those kind of natives, the the Brits. And, you know, the South Sea bubble played a huge role in redistributing wealth away from the people that he had just kind of taken over, basically. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there is a paper that's worth pulling up. And again, one that I that I helped uh, Earl Thompson and, and Charlie Hickson research a million years ago called Predicting Bubbles. Uh, and if you read it carefully, we have the uh, distinct uh, good fortune or or maybe foresight 
of predicting the real estate bubble of the mid 2000s back in 2002, 2003? You said two things. One is it it often is around a new technology. It's it's much less likely that there would be a bubble in Coca-Cola, for example, or uh, you know, old technology, things that have been around for hundreds of, of years, uh, whereas something new like computers or, or AI or, you know, any type of technology, that is often where it is. And then you also said it, it involves a reordering of the social order. That point, you know, I, I'd love to delve into a little more. What, what did you mean by that? It's kind of a, re, a reordering of, of society. Do of society. Is, is, is you mean a society where speculation is kind of prized? Yeah. So yes, and. Again, if you think about investing in general, right? Uh, And honestly, human activity in general, it's in its best form. It's about, as the expression goes, growing the pie, right? That's kind of productivity and the fact that, you know, the history of, of our species really is about, you know, technological invention and just getting more productive. It's about growing the pie and then sharing it, right? The thing about a bubble, which is go back to the basic thing that we started talking about, you know, a few minutes ago, the thing about a bubble is like, there is no fundamental thing going on that is growing in any way, shape or form in a sufficient manner to warrant the prices. And so as a result of that, you have to, it, again, this is a very mechanical point. This isn't some kind of, you know, conspiratorial thing. I'm just, it is painfully obvious that a bubble by the nature of the fact that the pie isn't growing fast enough for the prices to make sense it has to be that it's about moving money from one people you know one person's pocket to somebody else's that makes sense that's it that's it and so sometimes it's very intentional uh and again i give you the you know the example of when something like uh, you know the ascension of of James Stewart the first in in 1620 is like hey now i'm in charge of this thing and i'm not sure how i feel about the locals that's pretty like as plain as it gets. And then sometimes it's just the world is changing in ways that we don't totally understand. Uh, And as a result of that, you know, who's most favored in a society changes. And that's, that's just a, a, an, an, an ongoing process. It's not a bad or a good thing. It's just is. So those are two factors, which I think drive a a lot of equity uh, valuation could drive an equity bubble, maybe a, a real estate bubble about the hope of you know, immense earnings power. But when it comes to credit, it's less about the earnings power and more about the ability to repay debt. So what fuels a credit bubble where it's not a bubble in, oh, my God, you know, this this thing is going to make so much money. It's just it's a, a bubble about maybe how safe something actually is, such as mortgages, you know, historically, an extremely safe product, very low default rate. But then of course, you know, in the US and also in Europe, by the way, bankers took it way, way too far and put them these, you know, supposedly safe products into very, very risky structures. Tell us about, you said you, you wrote a paper, there's a, there's a paper predicting the uh, real estate bubble that, le- that led to the subprime crisis and the great financial crisis of 2008. Tell us about that in specific and then in general, what are the characteristics of a credit bubble now that we've laid out, you know, what are the characteristics of an equity bubble? Usually a credit bubble is a corollary to something else, right? Um, so we had a credit bubble because we had a real estate bubble. Uh, and you know, people got super excited about owning real estate. And of course the whole notion of owning real estate is leverage. Uh, and by the way, that's hard to beat, right? I mean, there's an argument for saying, Hey, Jude, if this thing really is, you know, appreciating on a secular, uh, horizon, uh, and by the way, it's not crazy volatile, right? That's the argument levering it, you know, five to one is a, is a pretty good proposition for, for wealth creation. And so the reason we had a credit bubble uh, in the, you know, mid two thousands, uh, was because we had a real estate bubble. So it credit bubbles tend to be kind of second order things, but they're usually the thing that kind of really kick you, uh, in the shins in the end, because credit or more generally speaking, fixed income, uh, has structure that is predicated kind of on certain outcomes being realized. And so when those outcomes aren't realized, it's, it's, uh, you know, really bad. And what I mean by that, of course, is repayment of principal. I, I tend to think of that as structure. When you buy a stock, it doesn't have a lot of financial engineering structure to it. It's like, well, it'll go up, it'll go down, we'll figure it out. And you're kind of signing up for that. When you buy fixed income, including credit, it's really a binary thing. Either it's performing or it's not. And when you keep doing things that increase the odds of non-performance, but you hope and expect that you're still going to get the good outcome, then it, it and you do that at scale, then it gets dicey. 
I'll give you another example, which I think is not uber concerning just yet, but I think is just worth keeping an eye on. I'm sure you're familiar with private credit, which is the idea that, you know, credit has been migrating from from the banking system or regulated system to, you know, private investors. It's hard to argue that we get to the place we are today with private credit without private equity. And that's kind of the point, which is in order to do private equity, you need leverage, you need access to funds. And when the whole world starts worrying about um, giving you access to that credit through the regular channels, then uh, the private equity people being savvy as they are say, well, gee, how about we create this other thing called private credit? And then we, you know, that's kind of a, a, a two for one type of deal. That's what I mean. It tends to be that credit comes after the first thing. So a appreciation in housing could fuel the the rise in credit, it, but in the same way, credit could fuel a rise in housing. So it can be a virtuous cycle, but also a vicious cycle. Sure. And that's where, you know, prices matter. When credit is cheap, people tend to abuse it. When credit is not cheap, people tend to abuse it less. And obviously, that is why historically a, a great deal of blame. And I think largely correct, but, you know, maybe a little bit exaggerated, because again, I think it, it happened in a broader context, but a, a huge amount of blame for the financial crisis laid at the feet of Alan Greenspan for keeping rates too low, too long. And as a result of that, creating a fertile ground for people to say, there's free money here, how about I put it to work? Tell us about private credit. Uh, as someone who's, who's on the wealth management side, uh, how much demand is there from clients because you know i mean private credit probably it's it's sold to some people but i i assume that the demand for it must be very high given how high it's growing yeah i think private credit is going through a transformation which is again where you know you have to start to worry a little bit when when you see things morph um private private credit historically has been really directed at institutional investors uh and predominantly insurance companies and that's fine, you know. I guess that's they're adults and 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 sophisticated and all you know all that kind of deal. They have professional investment staff. I think what you're seeing in, in wealth management today feels a little more sold than bought. That's where it gets you know a little more worrisome. Uh, the fact that private credit is migrating towards you know ultra high net worth and and high net worth investors through the creation of you know more accessible vehicles and so on and so forth. So yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sure some people are walking around, you know, because their friends told them that they've they've got some private credit exposure. I'm sure, some people are walking around saying, "Hey, I want some of that stuff." But I think most people are, particularly in you know, again, that private wealth, private banking world, they're probably being quote unquote educated about it in a way that leads to allocations. And this is where um, I'm sure you read uh, Jason Swag from the Wall Street Journal. How could you not? Uh, Jason recently had a, I think, one of the most important pieces that he's written in a long time. There was some version of, you know, when Wall Street rolls out the, the red carpet for you, ask why. And, and the fact that Wall Street is rolling out the red carpet to high net worth investors as it relates to things like private credit is probably worth asking why. What is the red carpet and how, do, how does Wall Street get people to walk on it? The red carpet is, is what the red carpet always is, right? Which is, hey, let me tell you about it. Let me educate you. This is a thing that your clients need in their diet, you know, all of that kind of deal. And I think that's probably happening in, let's just call it the independent, you know, wealth management space uh, to some degree. But I think it's probably happening, you know, 10x. And I mean, this is not a real statistic. This is a figure of speech uh, in the more captive uh, wealth management space where, you know, the the wealth management arm is is a part of a big company, that kind part of, of a big company. Thank you. What's the incentive? Again, in the in the world in which you think people are operating as fiduciaries, it's just hard when someone shoves, you know, again, high returns, low risk, you know, schmuckety schmuck in front of you to say, well, I'm going to say no to that. So that's just a, a you know, kind of a, a good guy instinct. There is then a slightly good guy instinct version of the story, which is what I would want to describe as the, the new shiny object principle, which is, hey, you've put your client in a very decent portfolio, and then, uh, you know, inherently, you want to combat the what have you done for me lately 
type of energy where you're like, well, every few months I try to put something new in front of the client. So they feel like I'm like, I'm not just kind of sitting back and, and, you know, kicking, you know, kicking back. So I think the good guy version of the argument is, gee, I should really consider this. This is a new thing. The less good guy version of the argument is, hey, that kind of keeps the conversation fresh with my clients. And then the really cynical version of it is, particularly in, in captive wealth management world, is uh, more fees for the home office. Would you characterize private credit as a bubble? Or has it not met your checklist yet? Not there yet? I don't think it's there yet. Uh, it's concerning. I just think, no, I don't think there is a bubble. But there is something about new shiny thing that, you know, everybody needs a big slug of that suggests a certain degree of herd mentality around it. Um, but no, I don't, I, I think private credit could disappoint. No question. Mm -hmm. It could also do fine, but I don't think it's a bubble as in, you know, run, you know, type of thing is just like, is that necessary for most people? I mean, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, you know, you and I both know that when people hear someone, especially on TV, calling something a bubble, they interpret, often they interpret that as this thing will collapse and decline sharply in price, you know, a 50%, 70% decline within one year. And so, you know, it's important to, to not call something bubble unless you think that, even though you think maybe, you know, maybe things are getting bubblicious, a bubble could be forming a bubble, the conditions for a bubble to form are, are present, something like that. But yeah, it's important to to not call something a bubble unless you, you really think it's, it's, you know, going down. Totally agree. And that's why I'm being, you know, very measured. I, I yeah. just, I just think it just might be, a th I mean, you know, a thing that is being sold a little aggressively. How's that for a description? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. What about as you scan the rest of the asset uh, uh, universe, everything else in fixed income, the stock market, European stocks, the US stock market, which is on, on fire, the red hot technology and AI sector, NVIDIA, in that entire universe, does anything smell of a bubble based on the criteria that we've discussed so far? In no particular order. Let's hit U.S. stocks first, just because I think it's it's a, a decent place to start. U.S. stocks are expensive. We know that. Um, you know, if you look at CAPE ratios, uh, Schiller PE is going back to 1880. I think the, the latest reading is something like the 97th percentile of valuations going back to, to 1880. Which, you know, eight, I'm sorry, did I say 87 or 97? If it, it was 97, whatever. 97, thank you. Um, so 97 isn't 100, uh, but it's pretty darn close. But we've been there before. In fact, we were there two years ago. Uh, and after a correction and a round trip, we're, we're back, right? So, and we did not, as you highlighted, have just an epic decline. We had a pretty rough decline, but we didn't have an epic decline as a result of where we were two years ago. So I think U.S. US large caps are expensive. And as a result of that, what do we know empirically is that valuations are pretty informative conditioning a variable, uh, you know, a thing that informs uh, future returns on a long horizon, like a 10-year horizon, not the next year, not certainly not the next month. You have to ask yourself, is the U.S. stock market in a bubble? I, it, again, I think we have to be very careful when we, when we say those things. And I think the answer is no, because, and by, but I mean, it's like, if you were, you know, forcing me to be very binary, I would say no. Uh, I think we're, you know, in a dicey spot where, um, valuations are high, volatility, implied volatility has been low, which means there's probably been a lot of uh, risk taking going on that, you know, hasn't been happening at, you know, very good prices. And so, you know, it's probably some version of, you know, 3.5, you know, four out of five type of thing on a, you know, concern meter. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about a bubble, a lot of it has to be just irrational exuberance, right? And, and all of that. And, particularly you mentioned NVIDIA, I've been really struggling with how to think about NVIDIA and its rise recently uh, and whether it's just irrational exuberance, you know, a very behavioral type of type of thing. And I'm having a hard time making sense of what we're seeing just on that basis. And as a result of that, I think it's, it's reasonable. This is, these are not knowable things. These are things where you just have to think your way through it and assign probabilities to it, right? I think it is reasonable to think of, of NVIDIA, for example, and therefore U.S. large stocks, because we know that NVIDIA has been leading the dance from a rational, you know, efficient market standpoint, where yes, NVIDIA has found itself at the right place at the right time with a product that is unequivocally a real thing, right? So right there. But when you see the price action, in relation to earnings that have grown hyperbolically recently, 
you ask yourself, what does it take for this to not be a bubble, right? What does it take for this to be kind of a rational response? And I think the the way to think about it is this may not be a rational price per se, but the response could be motivated rationally in the following way. Number one, NVIDIA, and, and by that I mean shareholders in NVIDIA, have got to be living in fear of the globe really cracking into. For, for these prices to make sense, NVIDIA needs to have the world as its addressable market, you know, over the kind of secular horizon. And we know that we're doing things and trying to prevent the chips from getting to China and so on and so forth. But right now, we're still, I think, living in the gray. It hasn't been, um, you know, the, the, there is a reasonable pathway to saying, well, no, once we sort out our differences, so to speak, uh, you know, the addressable market for these chips is still international, you know, global. Every day that we don't get to that breaking point with China, NVIDIA shareholders have got to be like, uh, you know, taking a, a, a real deep breath and saying, well, gee, today was a good day. And so that's just kind of rational price uh, compensation for bearing that huge amount of, of risk, number one. Number two is uh, what I would describe as political regulatory risk. Obviously, Europe is a little bit ahead of the US in, in terms of AI regulation, but ultimately, AI regulation in the US will be incredibly important to how this all plays out. And so every day that we're still living in the wild west of AI is a day where people are walking around thinking, you know, all everything is a possibility when it comes to applications. Uh, and so I think there is a good amount of quote unquote regulatory risk compensation because the people that are currently holding this stuff, which is kind of a proxy for AI at large, are just kind of holding their breath for what regulation is going to look like and what it means for the addressable market. And then the last one is what I would want to describe as economic risk beta. And again, the AI revolution is definitely real. You know, this is not a, an exercise in, 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 in being an AI denier or even a, an AI uh, down player. Um, it's just that however exciting this thing is, think about the amount of CapEx that it's going to require for this thing to kind of be in the bloodstream of American business. And if we actually hit a, a, a bad spot economically for any reason, right, this doesn't, whatever the thing is that causes CFOs and, you know, business leaders to say, I think we're gonna have to think about cutting expenses here. I think we're gonna have to think about how we're gonna make payroll. Uh, my suspicion is, you know, AI CapEx takes a, a you know a back seat for a period of time. And so that's kind of how I think about it at large. The US market has benefited from the AI reveal. Because again, I don't know if it's a revolution yet. It's just a thing that people weren't thinking about 18 months ago and they're now thinking about it all day long. And I think it's helpful to think about that as a really exciting thing happening under the best of circumstances. And if the circumstances change, the excitement might might be affected. You talked about the the fundamentals and about how Nvidia has really strong fundamentals. And I'll just you know say for our audience, it's easy if you don't look at the uh, earnings and you just look at the stock stock price. It seems like an obvious bubble, but I mean it's a uh, you know quarterly net income in a year ago in the 1.41 billion, and now in the same quarter, it's it's 12.98 billion. You know, its, it's earnings were in it's kind of a cyclical trough in 2022, but the the growth is just off the charts. And totally people, agree. People can look at a oh my god, it's trading at 75 times earnings, but that's looking back forward. If you just multiply like what it earned in in the most recent quarter, and then multiply that by four, so assuming pretty much no growth, its forward PE is something like. Uh, 40. So it's by no means cheap, of course, but is nowhere near as expensive or bubblicious as all the NVIDIA bears have been saying up and, you know, up until this entire point, like it actually got cheaper, uh, you know, in, in last year, at once its stock price started going, going crazy, and people initially started calling it a bubble, its earnings were going up so much, much more that it's, it's than its stock price that it actually was cheaper. So I would say, you know, it's just something that, that you referenced is that in late 2020 and 2021, the stocks that were going up the most had no earnings, they were mostly unprofitable, and they had severely flawed business models. And if they, they perhaps they had extraordinary growth, but it was by basically 
uh, you know, selling a dollar for a, like a one dollar and ten cents, and, do, and doing marketing and, and that kind of stuff. And yes, Nvidia and and other high quality stocks like you know, in the Magnificent Seven went went up a lot in 2020 and 2021 too. But what really led that market higher were the low quality speculative stocks. And so, with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that t- late 2021 was a bubble that you know does not compare to 1929 or anything like that. But it definitely, I would say, it was, it was a bubble because you had extreme speculation in low quality stocks. Whereas now it seems, and I wonder if you agree with this, that the shares that that are going up the most, like are justified by fundamentals. If you look at uh, NVIDIA, for example. Right. Agreed. And and again, I, the point is there is no disagreement here between the two of us, which is why one, I, 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 I explicitly said, I don't think the U S market isn't quote unquote in a bubble. Uh, and two, um, you know, I, I described it as earnings going hyperbolic, and that's actually happened with with Nvidia. So, so no no disagreement there. However, and again, this is worth noting: the historical data tell you that from now at this point of valuations, it's just hard to see, barring you know more of the same um, going forward. Just you know, extraordinary, uh, you know, out, outsized equity returns based on these current valuations. That's it. Um, now, uh, you were asking about, you know, a couple of, of other markets. It's very clear that, uh, you look at Europe, um, and one valuations are, are lower and two is it's not surprising why. And, and this is where, you know, I, I share a lot of, of the same DNA and, and, and pedigree and energy as you know some of my former colleagues including uh i know you recently interviewed jason sue from you know we were at research affiliates at the same time when people are fearful that's usually a pretty good time to lean into certain exposures and it's pretty clear that europe has been in a bad spot uh for the last you know two plus years now as there is a very real very scary war going on next door which one is real and scary, and two has impacted the European economy, particularly the German economy. That explains why, you know, looking at European equities might be worth it, just as a comparison to U.S. equities. Another one, which I think is a little bit more, um, you know, a little less straightforward, but but still, is Japan. When you look at Japanese equities, you realize fairly quickly that really these are global you know, multinationals that happen to be denominated and and headquartered uh, in a country with a, you know, very cheap currency right now. Now, we all know that um, it could get cheaper. Uh, In fact, uh, the Bank of Japan um, is very aware of that as well. Um, But in a world where things like French shoring um, is going on, in a world where unlike most other um, financial variables, um, currencies tend to be mean reverting. Buying relatively inexpensive stocks in a relatively inexpensive currency is kind of worth a look. But again, and, and this is where you really have to, to recognize, you know, particularly what I do, which is wealth management, which is, which is helping people be in portfolios that one, are relevant to their goals, and two, that don't uh, exceed their comfort, because there is no better way to fail than to to be, you know, beyond your point of comfort, and then something bad happens, because something bad always happens. And then you're like, I didn't sign up for this. And so my point to you in, in giving you this, this description is, if you're comfortable looking outside of the US, there are reasons to do so, but that's within your comfort comfort zone. In 2017, Forward Guidance's exclusive sponsor, Van Eck, was the first ETF issuer to file for a Bitcoin-linked ETF. Seven years later, Bitcoin ETFs are finally available. Using the Van Eck Bitcoin Trust ticker HODL, you can invest in Bitcoin with zero fees until March 31st, 2025. That's right, zero fees until March 31st, 2025. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today or visit vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more. Now, the disclosures. 
An investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL, involves significant risk and may not be suitable for all investors. You could lose your entire investment. The Trust offers fewer investor protections as it is not registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940 or as a commodity pool under the Commodity Exchange Act. For a complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the Trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. You can learn more about HODL and its zero fees until March 31st, 2025 at vanek.com slash hodlfg. That's vanek.com slash hodlfg. And now back to the interview. As far as the rest of the world, uh, you know, the, the rest of the investment uh, opportunity set is concerned. It's hard to turn up your nose when when treasuries are yielding 5%. You know, it's just there's a reason last year was the year of, of T-bill and chill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some people that I respect very much think T-bill and chill still isn't a, a bad place to be today. And, and, and it's hard to argue against that position, you know, that sort of thing. Right. But with the benefit of hindsight, investors in the U S stock market crushed T-bill and chill. No question. Last year. And so that just goes to show that valuation and theoretical frameworks for valuing equities, such as, oh, when interest rates go up, the discounted cash flows are in the future are worth less. They're, they're nice theories, but they you know, often do not work in practice, particularly for, for short-term trading and, and valuation. To tell us about the new Cold War that you see and how is that going to impact the investment landscape? In other words, you know, after the, the Berlin Wall f fell down and we had sort of that peace dividend, what is different about the future that you see in the investment world that, that wasn't true after the Soviet Union collapsed and we had the appearance of global peace everywhere at least? And it's funny because obviously the, the peace dividend was real, but it was really more of a U.S. hegemony uh, dividend mm -hmm. where, you know, kind of the way we wanted to run the globe went. Uh, and a big part of that was things like globalization. And, and I think this is where some of the economists, you know, are a little naive. It's funny because we were just talking about at the beginning about this concept that really ultimately it's all about growing the pie. And then once you've grown the pie, you can have an honest conversation about how to divide it. Uh, that's how it quote unquote should work. And so the argument, of course, post Cold War was let's grow the pie by making this thing, the world, one thing and do all the things that economists like to talk about, you know, specialize and you'll do the manufacturing and we'll do the other thing and it's going to be great. Um, and along the way, we failed to acknowledge, we failed to accept that it wasn't just growing the pie, that some people kind of fell off of the edge of the pie. Uh, and so, yeah, it's been a great time to be a U.S. equity investor because profits have grown relative to the share of wealth accruing to labor in the U.S., you know, stuff like that. But it's created tensions that I think all of us can can look at and if we're honest with ourselves say yeah I get it some people are some 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 people have had a rougher deal out of this than you know kind of the naive economists would say well we're all going to get wealthier and you know the rising tide and and all of that so yeah it it might be that uh in this new world the cold war 2 world it's it's actually riskier to be a U.S. equity shareholder. But as I noted, if you, if you give the efficient markets people just a minute, they'll say to you, risk is good because every day that the big bad thing doesn't happen, you have to be compensated for it. So that's great. But I, I think it's okay. I think it's, I think it's okay to accept that, to pretend that international competition isn't a thing at the nation state level. That's not always the best, right? To, like we 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 should compete, and we should compete in in aggressive ways that are peaceful. But maybe this is maybe this is a helpful way for us to snap out of this this la la land. That hey, we're all friends, and and it's one big happy global family. Look, the history of of mankind doesn't line up with that story very well. If if this means that our national compact is a little stronger as a result. And I don't mean like rallying around the flag, you know, jingoism stuff. I just mean yeah. actually caring about your fellow citizen in, in, a, in a real and empathetic way. I think that's good. Um, you know, so this is a scary time in a lot of ways, but also it's not the worst possible outcome. I mean, I, I, again, I, I go back to, you know, the silly point that I made earlier, which is, hey, treasuries at 5%, like 
that's kind of that's kind of good as an example you know so if people are like oh my god we've never seen we haven't seen this in a generation and what does it mean and all of that well it i mean it means bad things for some people uh you know borrowers but if you it's nice i think it's good for cash to be rewarded i think it's good to be able to say and this is where you know again i'm an option theorist at heart and and i think about kind of financial engineering if you need a hundred bucks in a year's time a couple of years ago, you had to put a hundred bucks on the table today. Now, if you put 95 bucks on the table, you've got yourself your hundred bucks in a year, round figures. Uh, and then you say, oh, gee, but I did start with a hundred. So now I can do other things with the remaining five. And that's how you get to, you know, kind of more structured ways of investing where you say, well, I've, I've, I've kind of, I've sorted out, you know, the floor, I've sorted out the downside and I can take upside with, you know, risk capital. Uh, is a you know as a good example. Forget five percent treasuries, tips. You know treasury inflation protected securities, which compensate holders for inflation, which is a a real scary thing, particularly when you open the aperture. Forget the last three years. Like look at forty years. Tips are currently yielding you know two percent and change. That's pretty. That's pretty healthy compensation on top of inflation. So I you know we. We're definitely, we, I think we've said goodbye to that post-Cold War, uh, you know, world. And part of that is, it might very well be, um, you know, higher interest rates and, and things of the sort. And so it's just going to be a different, it's just going to be a different environment. And, and as long as our leaders here and around the globe have the wisdom to, you know, not take it too far, then that's just, that's just the nature of, of, of how we operate on a global scale. Let's get specific. So this new Cold War, I think it is between US and China. And are you saying, and I, I'm not saying that you're saying this, I'm just proposing it to you to, to uh, tell, do you agree or disagree? Or actually, I mean, I mean this, but that, uh, you know, Apple uh, won't be manufacturing as many iPhones in China. Tesla won't be able to sell as many cars in China. That there, there will sort of be a, a minor economic blockade between uh, the, the two nations and maybe between the Chinese bloc, you know, without a K for our audience, yeah. and, and the, the Western bloc. And that in that world, maybe because there's friendshoring and you know, domestic production at, in more expensive places like America or Mexico, which is you know, a lot cheaper than, than other, other places, yeah. that, that there's uh, higher inflation rates and therefore you, you said higher uh, interest rates. Is, is that kind of the world you, you envision? And mm-hmm. might, that, might that world necessitate perhaps a slightly lower price to earnings ratio, i.e. lower stock market relative to earnings than what we have now? Yeah, I think that's a great summary. It certainly hits the, the main points. What jurisdictional risk would you feel comfortable taking in that environment? Because, okay, you know, investing in France, that's all right. But the, the, the more east you go, it gets closer to the conflict, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's really tricky. I mean, look, um, I'm French. I was born in Paris. So I mm. think a lot about Europe. And by the way, I think this is, you know, again, the world is a, is a rapidly evolving uh, place. So I, I don't, I don't want to say I know this for a fact forever. But I think if you ask the average European they want the EU. They want this thing. It's actually interesting when you think about the US today versus Europe today. Um, they're not that different. We're just like a, 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 a bunch of different places clumped together. I mean, look, we're fundamentally different in other ways. Like the US is a country and everybody agrees that, you know, we're Americans first and, you know, all of that type of deal. No one's walking around being like, I'm. Uh, whatever, a Californian first, you know what I mean, type of things, as opposed to the French and the Germans and all of that. But I think there is, I would not worry right now that um, you see a disintegration of the EU because I think Europeans want to be European. They see the value of it, both uh, economically and fiscally. I'm, so, I'm sorry, from a monetary standpoint, not fiscally. That's one of the things they're going to have to sort out. And from a defense standpoint. And so, yeah, I, Germany has gotten its face ripped off from a, from a stock market standpoint because it's closer to, the, closer to the conflict. I think this is true. I think um, Finland is looking pretty, pretty rough from a stock market standpoint. You know, some of these countries that are really close, definitely Austria. But ultimately, it's one European, I think it's one Western European bloc. Uh, and it doesn't hurt that within that Western European bloc, 
um, both France and the UK, which is elected to not be part of the EU, uh, are nuclear powers. Um, so yeah, it's scary and you don't know what's going to happen and it's getting reflected in prices, but really is Germany, is Germany at risk? I, I, I just don't see it. Right. From a geopolitical point of view. And I mean, again, I, I hope that co global conflict does not rise to be very clear, but if it does, that tends to be inflationary and good for producers and manufacturers of, you know, industrial tools. And, yeah. and Germany is definitely one of those, those countries. Um, but tell me about, as, as someone who was born in Europe, the structural issue of, okay, Europe is like the US and, you know, France is the New York, let's just say, for example, but New York, you know, issues municipal bonds, but its citizens also benefit from the immensely large and powerful fiscal government in, in DC, whereas Europe does not. It's only France. And they, they have a currency that they don't control. It's, you know, the European Central Bank. And there's, there are, I think there, you know, one or, one or two or three years ago, a uh, European bond issuance for the, all of the Eurozone. But I don't think that's a major factor uh, uh, now. And it, it does have this issue of if uh, Greece has issues, it can't print the drachma to stimulate its economy. It has to do some accord with Germany and, and everyone else. And do you think that's a, a structural weakness of the uh, European economy that necessitates lower price earnings ratios? The short answer is yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, the, there's a slightly more subtle answer, which is there's no question, right, that fiscal unity is is valuable. I mean, by the way, it is, again, it goes back to the, the founding of our nation, the U.S. And we don't think twice about the fact that, you know, on any given year, we need to, quote unquote, uh, underwrite Michigan or something. And, and the good people of the state of New York aren't, you know, kind of with their pitchfork saying, you know, why are we sending money to, you know, whatever, some, some state that's struggling, right? So um, that has the advantage of, of just kind of short, short circuiting some of these uh, internal conversations, but they're not not, I mean, again, they're not not happening, they're just happening in a much more streamlined kind of way. Um, and it, it's, it's almost like, a, you know, the human body, some of the functions just happen, you're not like every 12 seconds, you're not like breathe, right? You just breathe. Uh, you know, like make sure the heart's beating. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot, when you have that integration, some of the functions just happen more organically, but, and again, this is where we underestimate the importance of, of culture and part of culture. And I mean that in like a corporate finance kind of standpoint, right? Part of having a healthy culture is having a culture of conflict and conflict resolution. Because of the lack of fiscal integration, I think the EU has a benefit of being forced to kind of contend with these things in a more immediate way, as opposed to just kind of kind of sort of making it happen. And mm -hmm. so it's a much more intentional look at, hey, this is happening. What are we going to do about it? Hey, this is happening. What are we going to do about it? And so in a, in, again, in a weird way, conflict arises period. That's just the nature of things. Trade-offs arise. We either do this or we do that. And, and, you know, that sort of thing. When you're forced to deal with it in real time, like the EU is forced to deal with it in real time, you kind of sort it out. And then in a weird way, you've learned something, you've moved on, you, you know, you've, you've gotten to some form of either consensus or compromise in real time, as opposed to uh, the more organic thing where like kind of sort of someone's in charge, but then you wake up 20 years later and you're like, did I sign up for this thing? You know, <laughs> look, I, I guess my point, and I'm not trying to be pro EU just because I'm from Europe. I just want us to recognize that there are different ways to functionally organize ourselves and they have pros and cons. Definitely. That's a, that's a, that's a really good point. So I, I what did you get your PhD in? I presume it was economics, but or, or finance. But what particular part of what what you know subsector? I really was in basically the intersection of option theory and life cycle planning, and really it's the the life cycle planning part of it being kind of the application of option theory. Uh, you know, I, I was a student of of Bob Merton's in 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 uh, Boston. And, you know, I really learned option theory from what are some of the people that we consider the greats uh, and some people that are, you know, also very sophisticated 
on the more kind of modern side of things, people like Jerome de Temple at, at BU. Uh, and so I learned a lot about option theory and I think it just aligned with the way I inherently think about the world, which is think of the future as a whole bunch of different states of the world. You don't know which one's going to happen. Uh, and option theory allows you to kind of price different scenarios, right? So it's like the upside is going to cost you this much. The downside is going to cost you that, you know, all that type of deal. And then of course, life cycle finance is about how do we move resources over the course of decades, often, you know, associated with, but not exclusively, you know, related to things like retirement planning and just like, Hey, I have money now and I want money in 40 years type of deal. But when you align the two, you realize that moving money through thing, you know, through decades, like the retirement planning issue, or just the wealth management issue, generally speaking, which is literally about like, particularly, by the way, uh, for very wealthy people, where it's not about moving money from today to retirement date, it's like moving money through generations. Um, it is about risk management. It is about thinking about different scenarios. It is about um, pricing out, you know, all those things. So I mean, I'll give you some some very uh, painfully obvious examples. Uh, that I did work on, which is um, career switching at, at an individual level. Well, if you think about your career, if you think about your your income, it's an asset, right? It's it's a dividend paying asset where you do this thing, and whether you're doing it on your own and it's got a weird kind of upside type of uh, format to it, or you work for somebody and then you get this coupon every two weeks. You know, the point of the point is a career is a is a string of dividends. And imagine that you have the kind of human capital that allows you to go from career A to career B and career A and B have different attributes. Maybe one is riskier, maybe one is as more or less correlation with, you know, the economy or the stock market, then you can actually kind of apply option theory to that setup. And again, I gave you the description where we're talking about a person trying to manage their career. Uh, but the same is applicable uh, you know, in a, in a wide range of, of circumstances, I, I mentioned to you, I, you know, I worked for the Ziff family in New York, um, the Ziff family and we're talking, you know, these are gigantic businesses, right? The Ziff family was in the publishing business and the publishing business through the sixties and seventies and eighties had a certain attribute, you know, set of attributes when it came to, uh, earnings generation and so on and so forth. And, um, the internet came along and I think uh, through great wisdom, uh, someone realized that that dividend stream, its attributes were going to change in a post-internet world. And, you know, the family basically decided to sell the publishing business, Ziff Davis, um, and swap out, you know, one set of dividends in the future for another. So that's that's the way to think about that. Got it. When you say, when you say option theory, are you... You are or are not talking about uh, you know, stock options or f options in finance where it has a delta and a gamma and it's basically the right to buy or sell something in the future. Uh, you are not talking about that. You're or you're talking I'm about exactly talking about economics. that. I'm you are talking yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. And, the, and the point is, you can apply that. You can apply that body of knowledge to things outside of stocks, so to speak. And so, would that uh, theory intimately be involved with the opportunity cost doctrine? Uh, tell me more. It's just basically you're always comparing, you know, cash flow A against B or against C. Like, oh, I could walk my dog, but that's time that I'm not, uh, you know, spending time with my family. Or I could go surfing and that's great, but that's time I'm not working. You, you, you know, basically constantly comparing things. Correct. And, and, that's and that's the point, right? Which, and, and this is the thing that's really the one thing that is sophisticated about option theory relative to you know, kind of the basic thing, which is like basic NPV analysis, right? Mm -hmm. NPV analysis is like, I do it right now. And if, and if project A is a, is a penny worth more than project B, then I'm going with project A, right? That's yeah, kind net of, present value. Yep. That's net present value. Uh, but option theory says, wait, 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 before you make that decision, because right this minute, project A is worth a penny more than project B, like think long and hard about the long-term risk attributes of A versus B. And it might be that even though you're currently in the thing that seems like sub suboptimal, it's worth holding on to because who knows what's going to happen in a year, right? That's the way to think about that. 
tell us about the work you did at working for the, the Ziff family in, in 2008. Uh, well, again, I had just completed my PhD in, uh, in late 07, early 08. And I had the great fortune of, of uh, meeting with uh, someone who's become a, a friend and a mentor, Ali Crawford, who was building out uh, a much bigger and, and, and kind of fully staffed risk management function for, for the Ziff brothers, the, you know, Ziff brothers investments, uh, being the family office. And so I was one of, of a handful of people that joined in the summer of 08. And I remember Alec being the kind manager that he is, uh, and you know, I'm a kid at the time. And he says, well, you know, the first couple of weeks we're, we're not going to, you know, this is going to be pretty chill. You get to learn how to use the phone and the computers and, and, and where the kitchen is, whatever. Having um, coffee. Yeah. 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 And, 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 uh, it didn't last two weeks. It lasted some version of two hours, uh, because you know, the world was moving fast, uh, and things were, were getting, uh, uh, pretty scary pretty quickly. So I, you know, I did risk management. I did, you know, investment strategy, uh, at, you know, globally, uh, this is across all asset classes, all jurisdictions, so to speak, you know, through the financial crisis. And it was an incredible experience, one, to see all the things, you know, kind of move so fast. Uh, you know, I, I will forever remember, and you know, my boss's boss, so to speak, was, was a woman by the name of Katie O'Dwyer. Uh, and Katie was really in charge of the operations. Um, and I remember seeing Katie glued, you know, to her cell phone on the day that, you know, Lehman collapsed, just like basically some version of like, where's our money? When are we going to get it back? No, no, no. I don't think you heard me. Where's our money? Where are we going to get it back? You know, so on and so forth. And so it, it teaches you that investing and being the, the, whatever the person entrusted with mm -hmm. managing money, uh, at all levels is about markets. No question. But it's also about the plumbing. I don't care how smart you are. If your money gets tied up in Lehman bankruptcy, it's like, you know, whatever the expression is, no cigar. So you you joined right as it was collapsing. Well, it was it was a suspended state, right? I mean, if you remember then, uh, June, July, we knew the economy was slowing down hard. But June, July was still this weird world where that's when uh, crude hit, yep. you know, 140 or something. Well, yeah. So it was like things were going up and they were going up and, and they were, you know, certain things were going up, I guess is my point. And it was just like, what is this world that we're living in? So the real, obviously the real collapse happened, uh, you know, into September and, and, and October. So the summer was just this very strange suspended state where you're like, this can't. This, this isn't, this isn't the end of it, is it? And, you know, some people were desperate to convince themselves that it was. That the worst was over. Yeah. Once Bear Stearns has gone under and this and that, like everybody knows everything, right? You know, so now yeah. once we know everything, then, then it's just going to get sorted out. And of course it, it was not even close. Um, and, and this is again where it, every, <clears throat> I, I hate to sound, you know, woo woo about it, but in those scenarios, everything is connected to everything. And you just can't get around that fact, which is why we all know, you know, the quote unquote research, which is people say things like, well, geopolitics really don't doesn't matter for investing. And I'm like, well, it doesn't until it does. You know, there are these kind of points of in time where you can't run away from it. Uh, and so we knew there was trouble because of the mortgage situation. We knew there was trouble because, and by we, I don't mean any one person. I just mean, you know, the, the diffuse knowledge at the time. Um, we knew there was trouble because the mortgages, we knew there was trouble because the global economy was slowing down and, and, and was really going to slow down. But there was a lot of confusion and we just didn't know, you know, I mean, and then you, I mean, look, I remember the day I just told you, I remember Lehman Day, like it was yesterday, but I also remember the day TARP didn't pass the first time around. And you're like, I don't know what that means. Did we just give up on the whole thing? Like, are we, are we, you know, I would walk home. I would live in New York at the time. I would walk home from, from Midtown, from Park and 51st to Chelsea. And every day you would see, you would see, you know, more store closures and you would see all these things happen. We, we were uh, on the 14th floor of this, you know, tall building in, in Midtown. 
And I remember distinctly there was, you know, this is hedge fund land, right? And across the way, across the street, there was another building on the same floor across the way. You could see all these people with computers and doing things. And it seemed pretty clear that they were, um, you know, a hedge fund type of outfit. I don't know who they were. And this is the fall and winter of 08. So, you, you know, it gets dark early in, in mm -hmm. New York. And so by, by the time four o'clock rolled around, you could see in their offices like you could see in your own office. You know what I mean? And one day there's like tens of people and computers and desks and everybody's, you know, milling about. And literally the next day it was all gone. It was gone. The people were gone. The computers were gone. Everything was gone because, you know, all these guys had gone under clearly. Um, and so that's, you know, those, those are times that remind you that the range of outcomes uh, can get pretty wide pretty quickly. Jonathan, you published a note about engineered yield and the difference between natural yield and engineered yield and why, you know, it might be wise to be a little bit prudent and cautious with regards to some of these engineered yield products that, that Wall Street is turning out. So number one, what's the difference between a natural yield and an engineered yield in finance? And what engineered yield products have proliferated over the past few years? And why are you, are you somewhat wary of them? The difference between natural yield and engineered yield is pretty straightforward, which is the natural yield is just the thing that happens as a matter of course, right? So we were just talking about Europe a minute ago. And, you know, if you look at European dividend payers, they're kind of like natural yield. I'm not saying they're a good or a bad investment. That's not my point. My point is, if you're a utilities company in Europe, or, you know, a little less tasteful for some people, but if you're like a tobacco company in Europe, your thing is like, you run the business, you make money, you distribute it to investors, right? That's kind of like, there's no engineering going on. That's just like what the business is about, right? So that's, and you look at it and you say, do I like the dividend? Do I not like the dividend? But it's, it's kind of sort of high and for very kind of natural reasons, which is that's functionally what those businesses are about. The natural, the money is coming from the business. Right. The money is coming from the business. Uh, and that's kind of what the business is about. And it does. It, the reason I said I don't want to claim that it's good, bad, or sideways is you're, there are also certain things you're just not going to get out of that kind of a business. You're probably not going to get a lot of price appreciation. That's also not what they're naturally set up for. Um, engineered is the opposite of that, where you're. It, this has nothing to do with, you know, kind of the natural course of things. It's just like someone, probably someone who looks like me with, you know, a PhD in option theory um, had to put some, some thought and structure into juicing yield. And again, I'm just that, I mean, I'm, I'm being intentional in saying juicing and there is some negative connotation to it, but I, at, at the basic level, that's neither good nor bad, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples and, and going back to what you and I just talked about a minute ago with interest rates being at 5%. Imagine you start with 100 bucks today and you say, I want at least 100 bucks uh, in a year's time. And you say, oh, given where rates are, I can buy that 100 bucks in a year's time for 95 bucks today. And then that leaves me $5. And then if I want to get some upside going, then maybe I buy a call option on the S&P. Super straightforward. That's engineered, right? I'm, I, there was no yield in there, but there was, that's my point about engineering, right? That's like you put structure in place and you're like, now I get it. Now there's, there's a bond and there's a, and there's a, a call option. That's engineering. And the world that we live in now allows for engineering in a way that the world two years ago didn't. Again, if you, if you needed 100 bucks today to buy 100 bucks in a year's time, which was 2021, basically, then you had no money left over. So you couldn't buy the call and the whole thing just didn't work. Uh, now, that's kind of the benevolent version of it. Uh, now, let me tell you another story, right, which is... Um, a way to engineer yield is, of course, not to buy options, but to sell options. Now, we, we know that when you sell options, you get income now um, in the form of option premium. So imagine now that you say, well, gee, um, what I could do is uh, buy a bunch of stocks and then sell call options against these stocks. And of course, we know those are called buy right strategies or covered call strategies. And this is where, you know, that particular strategy has really grown massively recently. And it's been kind of ported into ETF formats and it's, and it's found its, it's found its moment in the sun. But if you think about what's going on, covered calls, 
you know, there might be a time for it and there might be uh, a time when it's not such a great idea. And one of the issues we're having now, so why is it kind of in general uh, something to tread carefully with? Well, you start with stocks. And so the whole argue, the whole notion is stocks go up a bunch or they go down a bunch, right? And so you say, when you do covered calls, imagine the following conversation. Hey, you own this thing and it goes up a lot or it goes down a lot. How about you sell me the upside, you keep the downside? Start there. The first line of defense, maybe you say, nah, I'm good. But if you're a little more sophisticated, maybe in, in, in the way you're willing to engage in the conversation, you say... At what price? Because you're you're giving up something really valuable, the upside of the thing that has two possibilities going up or down. Uh, and it happens to be that implied volatilities are low right now. And so what you're doing is you're selling off upside to somebody else for a low price. And so you have to ask yourself, is that a thing I'm willing to do to juice my returns, my current income by, you know, a few points? I, you know, that's, that's, again, the way to think about it at a basic level. Yeah, you've got more yield today, but did you get a good deal in achieving that higher yield? And do you like the resulting kind of distribution outcomes type of thing? That's uh, one version of it. Um, the other version of it is, you know, lives more in the uh, private wealth uh, private banking type of world, though not exclusively, where it's not, you know, covered calls. It's more like, hey, we're going to write this note. It's a mm -hmm. private, it's a private uh, investment type of thing. You know, it's not, it doesn't have a ticker. Um, and uh, you're going to make 9% unless, and this is the important part, unless the market is down a bunch. And if the market is down a bunch, congratulations, you get to participate in the downside, right? AK, lose money. And the 9% is, is a number I've seen. So, but if you think about the 9%, 9% is a 9%. 9% is 5% from a treasury and 4% from selling puts, right? And all of a sudden you're like, well, is selling puts for 4% and really providing kind of uh, catastrophe insurance to the stock market a good deal? And again, it goes back to what I just mentioned, which is right now, um, implied volatility on the US stock market is is you know, historically low relative to the full range of, 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 you know, values. I mean, look, uh, round figure VIX is probably around 12, 13, depending on the day. Um, that's not high. Uh, when you think that generally speaking, you know, volatility over whatever, just a forever horizon is probably, probably closer to 16%. And in times of crisis, we've seen VIX, you know, go up to 80 um, so I'm just saying, um, sure, you can put big fat yields in front of people's faces now, because honestly, what's going on in treasury markets more so than anything else, but ask yourself, are these good prices? Don't just stop at the yield. I need to say for our, for our audience, a put is the right, but not the obligation to sell something in the future, call the right, but not the obligation to uh, buy an asset in the, in the future and they are priced based on implied volatility. If implied volatility is high, that's pricing in that a lot that the asset will move in a, uh, a lot, uh, move around a lot more. So the, the option is, is more valuable. The call covered call strategy of owning the asset and selling a call option against it. If you're saying that, you know, you're kind of not in love with that strategy and I'm sure you've got the data to, to back you up. Does that inherently mean that calls are somewhat overpriced, excuse me, underpriced, and therefore selling them are a bad idea? You know, in other words, if, if selling them is a bad idea, does that mean that calls are kind of oh, underpriced? No. Um, they're selling for cheap now on things like the S&P, right? That's the only thing I can tell you. This isn't, this isn't a unconditional statement about calls are always too cheap or something. Um, sometimes they're cheap, sometimes they're expensive. Um, Right now, they seem relatively inexpensive. Um, that's what I mean. But this really is, it, it's a two-track consideration that people have to kind of go through. Do I like the distribution of outcomes? Number one, right? Do I, am I okay capping my upside and retaining downside in exchange for a little bit more income today? 
that's kind of like a close your eyes and, and envision it type of thing. And then step two is like, if, I, if I'm okay without general distribution, are the current prices making that more or less attractive? And that's, that's where, you know, you can look at things like the VIX, which is implied volatility and the S&P, and it'll quickly educate you that you're probably not getting as much kind of marginal income as you think you are or should be relative to like, you know, the full range of, of the world that we've lived in. Got it. Well, Jonathan, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you and getting, getting to hear your ideas. Where can people find more about you, uh, your, your work and your company? Um, well, the easiest place to go to is my website, trussard.com, which is the, the website for Trussard Capital Management. It's T as in Thomas, R-E-U-S-S-A-R-D as in David.com. Uh, and you'll find a lot of information there along two dimensions. One is uh, learn more about our approach and, and how we work. And, and, and again, the baseline is... Um, it really is a, a boutique wealth management experience predicated on my experience uh, and predicated on, on the concept that um, really uh, your wealth management experience should be aligned around someone paying attention to your stuff, someone asking you questions like, what is this money for? Uh, and importantly, what is this money about? Because in a lot of ways, if you start defining what the money is about, um, it helps you make sure that your wealth doesn't define you. Instead, you define it. Uh, on our website, if you're curious about working uh, with me, um, please contact us. There is a big, fat contact us button in the top right corner. Um, and I would be delighted to have a conversation and explore um, and if that's not where you are and you just want to kind of continue to receive my thoughts on markets and the world and, and the economy, I, I put out a, a newsletter once or twice a month. I try to be a, a light spammer. Uh, and at the bottom of every page, you can just put your name in and your email address and you'll be added, um, to the newsletter. So that's really where to learn more is trussard.com, T R E U. S S A R D as in David.com. And Jonathan, I think, you know, I don't speak with a lot of wealth management folks, but uh, it is so important for investors to know what their goals are and what they, uh, for, you know, want. If they're a retiree, they you know, are, should not be taking as much risk. If you're an 18 year old, you know, you shouldn't own any bonds. You should be in, in stocks that, are, that appreciate over time, uh, unless you have some very you know, special issue of, of course. Um, and it's also about how much risk you think you can take. And you know, I have on, okay, I, I interview someone, they're a recessionista, and they think interest rates are going to collapse. And then I interview someone who's in, in the no landing camp, they think interest rates are going to go up, the recessionista is wrong, and the no landing person is right. But you know, what does that mean for someone watching my show? Like, are they, you know, shorting interest rate futures? I mean, if they're sophisticated, maybe, but you know, if they're, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't have experience in fi finance, probably, probably not. And, uh, they should be, yeah, aw just aware about what their own goals are, you know, know, know their own situation, but then also know themselves, how much risk can they take? How much risk do they feel comfortable with? And that's, that's important. No question. No question. And, and that's exactly right. Which is ultimately this is very personal. First of all, your money is personal. Your relationship to your wealth is personal. But then what is comfortable for you and what is aligned with your goals and, and risk outlook and all of that is inherently uh, very personal, which is why, again, you know, when I try to tell people what I do and I try to be cute, I say, look, I, I help people escape the wealth management industrial complex. And that's the whole point, which is you really you really deserve a very personal experience because uh, there's so many factors at play. So when you say escape the wealth management uh, industrial complex, what does that mean? Because you know, in an ideal world, the entire wealth management industry would be trying to help people goals. Like what is, what do you, what do you mean when you say that? Well, I think people, particularly people that have experience with <clears throat> it, um, you know, for them that resonates very directly, which is like they're, 
um, ask yourself a couple things. Do you really feel like, you know, your investment strategy and your, and your wealth manager and financial advisor, uh, are giving you, you know, truly personalized advice or are you fitting into a bigger machine, uh, where, you know, the degrees of freedom are again, inherently dictated by scale and the ability to, you know, process people in the hundreds and thousands, if you will. Um, and, you know, along the lines of what you and I discussed during this conversation, do you feel like you're being sold a bunch of products? Do you feel like sometimes you might even be the product yourself as opposed to the client? And that's what I mean. Mm, that makes sense. Well, Jonathan, thanks again. And thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL.